Hello and welcome everyone to Channel 781 News. Uh, this week in Waltham, we have a breaking story for you. Councillor Paz is being sued by the Massachusetts Party. Um, so we'll tell you more about that. Also in Waltham this week, there was a picket against a company called Waltham Superior Drywall. So we're gonna learn more about that and we're gonna have a guest, somebody um, who we wanted to bring on the show for a while, Tom Geerty. We also have another person who we wanted to uh, bring on the show for a while, and this seemed like the right time to do it. Um, Heather May is with us. Hello, Heather. Hi. Heather May is running for the state legislature, so we'll tell you more about that. Um, so I'll start with community events as we usually do. There actually aren't new any additional events besides the ones we've told you about in the past for July. Um, but there is, a, we did want to give a reminder that there's city council this coming Monday because that's August 1st. That's when they're going to have the special meeting. They'll be discussing the fernal. They'll probably be discussing pot shops. Um, so keep an eye out for that. And then on August 12th, um, there's going to be a public hearing regarding the community development, the block grant. That's an online hearing. I don't know much about it, but I just want to mention it. It was on the, the bulletin board. Um, and uh, if you know any other events happening in town for July or August, contact um, Hammer Patriot on Reddit and get them added to that list. Um, so I'm very excited to have uh, Heather with us. Um, she has been working on her campaign already for a few months, um, but we uh, started getting more visible. You may have seen, heard people knocking on your door or leaving um, literature there. Um, so uh, she is running for state representative. So if you live in Waltham, your representative in the state legislature's House of Representatives is either Tom Stanley, um, who represents most of Waltham, and he used to represent part of, he used to represent Lincoln, but with redistricting, he just represents Waltham. As you know, he's also a city councilor. Um, and Heather is challenging him for his seat. They're both Democrats, so she'll be challenging him in the Democratic primary, which is on um, September 6th. So in order to vote in that, you either need to be a, a registered as a Democrat or unenrolled. The way it works in Massachusetts is if you're enrolled as a party, you can't vote in someone else's primary, but if you're unenrolled, you can vote in whatever primary you want. But you do need to be registered, and the de deadline to register to, to vote in the primary is August 27th. And of course, there is no Republican candidate, so whoever wins the primary will get the seat unless something very unusual happens. But still show up to vote in November, too, because there will be other important things on the ballot. The other thing, exciting thing to know about Heather is that she helped out uh, with Councillor Bradley MacArthur's campaign last year. And um, as you know, uh, Representative Stanley is very established. He's been in the legislature for about 20 years. He's the son of a former mayor of Waltham and he's been on the Waltham City Council for a long time too. Um, so he's a very established candidate, but we saw Councillor Bradley MacArthur be a very established candidate last year. So we think this is going to be an exciting uh, race to watch. So welcome, Heather. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So uh, I want to find out just the basics on, you know, who you are and why you're running, but I want to start with a little bit harder question first, if that's okay. So sure. before you started your campaign, you were the head of Waltham Democrats, and you're running as a Democrat. Um, I think a lot of our audience members are on the left of the political spectrum with some very notable exceptions, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're Democrats or they're excited about voting Democrat right now. So what does being a Democrat mean to you and why should anyone be excited about voting Democrat right now? <laughs> That's a wonderful question. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think in when we look sort of federally um, and, and we look at what's going on with Democrats uh, at the national level, um, I mean, the answer to what's going on is not much. Right. Um, and I think that's a lot of the frustration that a lot of us Democrats feel um, at, at the national level is that we're just we're not doing enough. We're, um, you know, not standing up and fighting for the things that we believe in um, in a way that feels, um, you know, strong enough for most of us. And 
I think that for me, that also translates into the state um, Democrats and it translates into this particular race. Uh, I think that, um, you know, as you said, Tom Stanley has been around for a long time. Um, he knows a lot of people, um, but I don't think that we've seen him do enough for the ninth Middlesex over the last 20, 22 years. Um, and I think the people of Waltham deserve more. Uh, I think they need someone to fight for them. You know, we are dealing with um, all of the things <laughs> all of the time, right? Uh, housing affordability, climate change, um, transportation, policing, you know, all of those things are on our plates. And I don't see my rep doing the job that I want being done for me. I don't see my voice and the voices of people in my community being amplified for. So to me, being a Democrat um, means that you are fighting for a better world for everyone. That That's my very simple definition of being a Democrat. Um, you know, I love uh, uh, Julia Meha, the uh, Boston City Councilor, who always says, you know, all means all. And um, I think that we have a lot of Democrats in Massachusetts who are looking out for number one, which is them. Um, and not looking out for the rest of us. And so that's, you know, brought me into the race. And um, that's what being a Democrat means to me is really just fighting for other people. You said that that applies, what you're saying applies to this race and that you're, you're not, um, you don't think people are getting what they want um, from Representative Stanley. What are some of the specific issues there? Yeah, so there's a lot of things, you know, we've been out on the doors since uh, February, and some of the things that I'm hearing a lot are um, things like, we need um, to improve, you know, our, our transportation infrastructure. Um, people are frustrated that public transportation, you know, in Waltham, it's, it's just not very feasible, especially for families, for people who work, you know, maybe um, in closer to Boston, to get back and forth in any kind of um, reliable way, right? Um, also, you know, things like housing affordability. Um, I've talked to a lot of people um, from young families just moving in to, uh, you know, seniors who have lived here their entire lives, who are really concerned about how much money they're having to spend on rent or on mortgage payments because it's not sustainable. Um, I think the one thing that people really uh, are upset about, and we talk about a lot on the doors, is the issues that we have with transparency or the lack of transparency at the state house. Um, you know, when we talk about the difference between Democrats, um, transparency is, is really number one for me. Tom Stanley has voted against every single <clears throat> transparency measure that has come uh, before him, you know, and that means he's voted no on making his committee votes public. Um, he's voted no on, um, you know, uh, standing for roll call votes at a lower threshold than what it is right now. Um, He's uh, voted no on having, uh, I think, 48 hours to review bills. Um, and I just recently was, you know, reading through the, the climate change bill. And I was like, I, you really need 48 hours before you decide to, <laughs> to hit a yes or no button on this. Um, and uh, he voted no on, on 30 minutes to look at amendments before you vote on them. Um, so what that says to me is that the governing is not happening in, on the state house floor, right? It's happening in the back room 
It's happening way before the bill comes out. It's happening in committee behind closed doors with no transparency around votes that are taken, et cetera. Um, and to me, as a Democrat, that is antithetical to democracy. Um, and that really resonates with our voters. Um, and they're very upset uh, that that is what is taking place at their state house. And they want a state representative who believes in a transparent government. Why do you think that is? Why do you think the legislature or, um, is resistant to changing those seeming failures of uh, transparency? So I think some of the things that you hear people talk about um, are these kind of um, excuses like, well, being able to vote in secret gives committees more power. Um, well, to me, that says they're already aware of the fact that they have a speaker who has entirely too much power. So they, they're right in their answer there, it's saying there's an imbalance of power um, that we can't govern around. Um, I also think that it, that's just a bad answer because um, you are elected to be a representative of the people, right? Um, and that means the people have to know whether you're representing them or not. And so if you, you know, if I don't know how you voted in committee, I don't know if you really fought for my bill or not, right? Um, and that is just infinitely frustrating, I think, to a lot of us who have been advocating for more progressive policy positions over the years and just seen them, you know, just sit in the house and wither away and die. Can you yeah. give us something, an example of an idea that was seemed like it had momentum in the legislature and then didn't end up working out? Well, I mean, there are lots of, you know, I think um, the fair share amendment basically uh, in some form or another has been around for at least a decade. Um, and, and I think almost two. Uh, and it just, you know, just kept going nowhere and going nowhere and going nowhere until we have finally got a, a couple of, uh, you know, more progressive um, reps. And we have um, some amazing advocacy groups uh, who have organized around it and we get to vote on it in November, you know? And so finally, um, hopefully <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll get our, our fair share amendment passed, um, but it's taken decades. Let me ask you uh, about another thing to, that came to mind when you were talking about things that sort of got going in the legislature. In 2020, the legislature was discussing police reform, and there was a bill that would have um, eliminated qualified immunity. Um, Tom Stanley voted against that. There was then a, a negotiation with um, the police organizations, and that bill was significantly revised. Um, to be more acceptable to them. Um, Tom Stanley still voted against it, but it passed. And since then, we haven't really heard anyone at the state level or here in Waltham talking about police reform. Um, do you want to say anything about police reform? Um, I think that it's um, shameful that we have a state rep that couldn't even bring himself to vote for what I consider a fairly watered down police reform bill. Um, you know, so I think in my conversations with uh, police from Waltham uh, in, you know, Boston, I, I work in Boston, um, that they want to feel safe as well. Um, and I think that's why you saw some of the um, the compromises that were were made uh, because they, you know, there's an understanding that that something has to change, that the way that we police in the United States has to change. Um, but Tom Stanley decided that, you know, he was going to join a very small group of Republicans to vote against that final bill. 
Um, I think we haven't heard a lot about it since then, um, perhaps because the bill passed and then we're in an election year. So uh, waiting for people to get into you know, their um, elected positions and then see what happens with it. Um, so and you think it could come back up um, if in the next session of the legislature? Yeah, because I think, you know, uh, passing a bill is really hard in the Massachusetts State House, but um, implementing a bill like a police reform bill is also incredibly difficult. And the fight does not stop when you have the votes, right? It, it continues. You have to get, you know, funding. You have to have some sort of um, checks and balances, you have to have ways of implementing trainings, you know, all of those things. Um, and that is still going to have to be um, advocated for. Thank you. Okay, so I've got the tough, now that I've given you some tough questions. Now, <laughs> do you wanna just tell us a little more about who, who Heather May is and, and how you ended up in Waltham and why you're running for office? Sure. Um, well, let's see, I'm originally from Nebraska. Um, and I moved out here to go to graduate school um, many years ago, uh, 97. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, growing up in Nebraska, I, I grew up with a lot of people that seemed very at home with contradictions to me, um, <laughs> where they were very, you know, it's a, a very sort of community oriented people who will do anything for each other. Um, you know, I can remember um, at, when I was younger, I, I think I was like middle school, we were reshingling the roof of our church. And um, there was like, you know, some of us kids out, we were playing, we weren't shingling, um, <laughs> but our, our fathers and, and mothers were, and a group of guys drove by who happened roofers, they had just gotten off work um, and they just pulled in and started helping. And that's the kind of people that I grew up with is you just roll up your sleeves and you get to work. During that time, what I also saw was um, my dad and uh, my his dad, my, my grandpa Erickson, um, both worked in sort of the healthcare field. Um, my grandfather worked, he was uh, president of the Rural Hospitals Association for um, many years. And he worked really hard to get the accessibility to basic healthcare, like hospitals, into rural areas. My dad uh, kind of followed in his footsteps. And, um, you know, I, my dad and I used to meet and we would have conversations uh, before he was headed to Washington to go <laughs> talk to his, uh, his senators. And, um, you know, seeing him do that even though I know he hates to talk in front of people, and, um, but it was important. And he was speaking for people who, for whatever reason, did not have the voice to make those things happen on their own. When I got to Waltham, we moved here in uh, 2014. Um, you know, this community felt very much like home. It was a roll up your sleeves, let's get it done kind of community. And I just love uh, that about Waltham. There are a lot of growing pains right now for kind of becoming um, the kinds of cities that America needs. Um, and so, you know, I think there are a lot of people being left out of those conversations. And that's why I'm running is because I want to be able to bring those voices in to amplify them when I'm the one that has to be in the room, but also to work really hard to bring their voices into the room because um, people can advocate for themselves um, when they have the chance to do so. Uh, but our state house does everything it possibly can to keep them on the outside. And I just think that's wrong. Thank you. 
Um, I saw you a few weeks ago when we the news was leaked about, well, more than a few weeks ago now when the news was leaked that Roe v. Wade was about to be overturned, there was a flash protest in Waltham, and I saw you there. And um, that is a national issue, but we've talked on our show about how it can also be a state issue and a local issue. Um, what would you do in the legislature in the area of reproductive rights and, and gender justice? So I think, you know, so far um, we've we've responded well, I think, in Massachusetts. Um, we have put together, you know, the Beyond Row um, Coalition and um, a series of um, legislative ways in which we can keep people safe, we can keep access uh, to reproductive health care, to abortion. Um, we can make sure that um, our providers are safe um, and we can be a safe haven for people in other states that um, need access to abortion care. Um, so I think we're, we're doing a good job, um, but again, it's kind of like the police reform. This is not something that's just going to like, okay, we're cool. Um, <laughs> you know, let's moving on. Um, it's, it's a fight that's happening, you know, on a national level and it's happening on a state level. And, um, the, the day that the decision came out, I was actually doing an endorsement interview with, um, a group called Her Bold Move, um, which, uh, works to put women into, uh, you know, political seats that have never had a woman, which the ninth Middlesex has never had a woman in the seat. Um, pretty sure it's never had anything but a white man <laughs> in the seat, um, looking at the history. And, you know, we just, um, we came on and they were like, hi, how are you? And I said, how are you? And like, there was four of us, we, we cried for, you know, like a good five minutes. Um, Cause it's, it's very hard in 2022. And especially when you have as much privilege as I do, I'm a white heterosexual middle-class cisgendered woman. Like I really couldn't have much more privilege if I tried. Um, and yet to wake up one day and go, Oh, I don't, have the right to make decisions about my own body. That's just, it's shocking on a variety of levels. And I think it also, you know, we've talked about in the media, it, it opens the door to other civil rights issues that we have considered settled. And um, if that happens, we need people who are going to really go the distance and fight for those things. And that's something, you know, I've been doing my whole life. There's one more thing that I know will be important to our audience, and you sort of brought it up, which is the climate bill. Um, can you kind of, for those of us who haven't been following state politics closely, can you catch us up on where climate is at and, and, and also what you'd like to see happen? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> Cliff Notes version. Um, so th there are a lot of good things um, in this in this climate bill. Um, one thing that I think we need to talk about is the fact that um, the legislative session is over on Sunday, and we are just getting the climate bill passed. That is ridiculous. Absolutely, there there's. There's no excuse for the pace at which things move in the state house. So now what we've done is we've put ourselves in a position where it's sitting with Governor Baker and something has to happen by Sunday. And if it doesn't, then, you know, and, and we have a, a super majority, a democratic super majority. We, you know, there's no reason except that when you look at the climate bill, you can see that the House and the Senate, they had a long way to go before they got to somewhere where they felt comfortable 
with the bills that came out of their respective chambers. Um, the, the House um, seems to be very focused on um, like offshore wind, renewable energy and infrastructure and things like that, which I think is great, um, you know, and it's um, putting together, you know, new industries and new technology. And, and you know, I think that that's um, really a strength that we have here in Massachusetts is doing things like that. On the other side, the, the Senate, you know, we're really sort of uh, focused a little bit more on like transportation infrastructure, um, you know, going electric, no rebates for any, um, you know, appliances that use fossil fuel, um, you know, so that we can start transitioning, especially in new construction to um, electric. And I see uh, Tom here talking about construction. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I really think that there are a couple of things that are missing in the climate bill. And the first one is a reasonable <clears throat> timeline. And by reasonable, I mean a timeline that can affect change before we're all underwater. Um, 2050 is it's just ridiculous to me that we're we're looking out at 2050 when we know um, that we need to cut emissions in half in 2030. We need to cut them in half again in 2040, cut them in half again in 2050. Like we, this is a big job because we have created this problem. And so we have to fix it. And, you know, there are some of those, um, societal changes where society changes first and then we legislate and then there are some of them where um the legislation comes first and then we move society right and i think that climate change is one of those things where we will have to legislate change because it's inconvenient for people right um and We've, we've seen everything from, you know, masks to <laughs> heat waves. Uh, people don't like to be inconvenienced. Um, and so especially big developers, um, especially, you know, big corporations, uh, they don't want anything that's going to eat into their margins. Um, we need to, developers should have a seat at the table, but they shouldn't have the whole table, right? Um, and, you know, like Governor Baker's um, climate uh, conference committee or what, I forget what they were called, but it was all real estate, uh, you know, and, and developers. And these are not the people uh, who are taking climate change seriously right now. Um, the woman who's the vice president of the Massachusetts Commercial uh, Construction Organization, I'm forgetting the name, it starts with an N. Um, she said, you know, 2050 is just, that's too fast. <laughs> okay. Can she swim? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Let me get my snorkel out, you know, <laughs> we'll talk about it some more. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, hopefully, uh, I mean, Charlie is probably going to send it back. Uh, and hopefully we do it in time to override the veto. Um, and we'll have something, you know, a good start to work with. Chris or James, did you have any questions for Heather? James? I didn't really have a question as much as a comment. And it's that, especially with the road decision, it's more and more of stuff that we would associate with like the federal government doing since become falling on the states. And that's the importance of having good people in state legislature and a transparent process for things getting done in a timely manner. And like yeah. you said, I'm bringing up climate change and housing. These are things that need to get addressed and they're related to each other as well as transit. And you can't have a comprehensive climate solution without addressing housing and transit for people. Simple as. Yeah, simple as, absolutely. All of our, our buses, our public transportation needs to be electric. We The grid has to be updated. Um, we need, you know, more solar um, and uh, we need, the new construction of housing inventory to be above and beyond 
Um, it can't just be business as usual, or we just continue, you know, we perpetuate the problem. Yep. And also that construction has to be good for the workers. Yes, it does. Absolutely. So Heather, I feel like, I feel like I should like recuse myself from this conversation because uh, <laughs> we've been friends for many years now. And also I've been knocking on doors for you during this uh, election cycle and also your last election cycle as well um, in War II. Um, but uh, I mean, the number one issue for me when it comes to elected folks in Waltham is how involved in the community are you? So if you'd like to take a moment to talk about how you've been involved in the Waltham community since you've been here. I think actually you and I met at a progressive Waltham uh, meeting. <laughs> um, and I also, I, I often give Chris and um, Kelly Dam uh, the credit for me being so involved in politics <laughs> since the pandemic and even before then, things like housing and food insecurity have always been important to me. And I've been delivering food for um, Waltham Mutual Aid. Um, my favorite thing was uh, going out to the farm and picking up, you know, an entire carload full of produce. <laughs> the, the, the week that it had bags and bags of basil was amazing because my car smelled so good. Um, we also, you know, we have wonderful programs like um, the Waltham Partnership for Youth, I was just able to do some um, communication uh, courses for their new interns uh, because they're going into their new internships and uh, thinking about, you know, how to write emails in the workplace and how to have, you know, conflict and conversations and all of those things. And um, that was really, uh, really fun. That it's a wonderful organization. Thank you very much, Heather. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Thank you, Heather. So yeah, so if you uh, are happy with you, what you've heard from Heather, you can vote for her on September 6th in the Democrat primary, or you can volunteer to help with her campaign. If you're not eligible to vote because you're not 18 yet or any other reason, you can still help on campaigns. And that's a good way to learn about them. I always like to mention that. Uh, so thank you very and, much, Heather. And good luck. Oh, and go don't, ahead. don't forget, September 6th is the day after Labor Day. It is the ah, day okay. after the last long weekend of the summer. It's a wonderful day to have an election. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but your vote by mail uh, applications are on their way. Um, so if you know that you're not going to be around, make sure you fill that out. Good point. Thank you. Yep. And now our thank you, Heather. Now our other guest is here, Tom Geary. Hello, Tom. Hello. We know the answer to this, but our audience doesn't know. What's your trade and what's the name of your union and what's your role in the union? So I am a 17 year member of Carpenters Local 339. Um, my union recently kind of went through a merger of three locals. Our hall, our union hall used to be located in Auburndale. It's now in Wilmington. Um, I'm a job site steward. And I'm also president of my local. So thank you for being on, Tom. Uh, we wanted to bring you on the show for a while um, to talk about labor and worker issues. And I saw on social media, your union, um, we'll probably throw up a photo that I found, um, your union picketing at a local Waltham site from a contractor called Superior Drywall. Uh, so this was an easy excuse to have you on to talk a little bit more about labor in general, but how did that picket go? And can you talk a little bit about why you guys go out there? So technically that particular picket we were on last week is in Lexington. It is right on the Waltham line um, on Waltham Street next to the old friendlies which is now a bank um the general contractor on that site is callahan who oh. we've um had many pickets against um they've performed a lot of work in the city of waltham um they're currently on second ave they're currently on third ave they burned down cooper street hmm. um so the subcontractor in question that we were holding the picket against superior drywall, we have written affidavits from 
um, some of their employees that they're being paid cash off the books. So that's obviously a concern. Um, in this case for the town of Lexington, um, when you're paying employees off the books, um, certain, you know, the police, the fire, the funding for schools, that's all paid for by tax dollars. And when these contractors are paying people off the books, every, every taxpayer is uh, affected by those. And it also affects the workers and not um, putting money into social security and other programs like that. So th that's what that um, informational picket was. And usually that's the basis for our, our uh, ongoing picketing in this area. So your hope is to attract the city's attention and then uh, the municipality won't do work with them in the future? Is that is that the goal? It's, it's to raise um, public awareness, um, to let people know what's going on within their cities and towns. It's to put pressure on the developer to say, hey, you know, you're doing the wrong thing. And um, also, you know, in some cases, it's to let the workers know that we're there and we have their backs. Um, we've helped uh, a lot of non-union carpenters recover a lot of wages that they haven't been paid because, believe it or not, a lot of these people just aren't paid. And we're not talking about $10, $15. We're talking about thousands and thousands of dollars. Uh, the local carpenters union uh, acquired the contract to build the new high school. Uh, I've been seeing you uh, post pictures of that a journey, um, and that's essentially your assignment for the span of three years, four years. Do you want to talk a little bit about how that's going? Yeah, so we, uh, um, the contractor, the general contractor on the site is Consigli Construction. Um, they are signatory contractor of ours. So luckily for us, the bid list for that project was four or five contractors and they were all signatory with us. So we knew um, pretty early on that we'd be working on the project and really just given the scale of it. Um, they're, a, they're a huge company and that's not a bad thing. Um, they're a family oriented company. They've been in the area for uh, a long time and um, they do great work. Um, the projects so far on time, on budget um, and everything's going well, um, as good as it can be. And uh, so my assignment from my business manager, we, ha we have job site stewards. So I'm assigned the task of steward on the job. So I work with my tools first and foremost, but I'm also there, um, at, I guess, as most people would see as kind of like grievance, kind of grievance, watching over the members, making sure everybody's working safely. Um, and uh, that our end of the collective bargaining agreement is being held up. So during special permit hearings on Waltham City Council, I've seen the union leadership, and most recently you, uh, sometimes they'll come in and give input during these hearings, urging a developer for the special permit uh, to consider hiring union-led uh, contractors instead of notoriously unsafe contractors like we just talked about. Um, can you elaborate on that practice a little bit? Um, <clears throat> because Waltham City Council can't vote to make anyone hire anyone. So I'm curious if this has been effective at all, or is it just a means to spotlight unsafe practices from those contractors? Um, I think it's, I, I would say it's in line with um, any concern from any citizen on really a, a myriad of issues, um, especially when it comes to the public hearing process. Um, and we, find that time to, you know, to be effective, to let the community know um, what's happening as far as developers working in, in, um, in the city, uh, developers and the, their hired contractors. Um, the, other, the other end of it is we have hundreds of members from my local and as well as there's hundreds, of, hundreds and hundreds of carpenters by trade that live in the city. And the city council is elected by voting 
members of the city, carpenters and, and people alike. So, you know, it's, it's a good time to let this, the members of council and as well as the mayor, if she's involved in the process, our concerns as constituents as well. I think it's a good strategy. It's, it's nice because that's one of the only times that anyone can say anything during uh, city council is those special permit hearings. So utilizing those is a, is a good tool. Um, so what are some ways resident, what are some ways for residents to support workers, unions, and use unionization efforts locally? Um, I think it, it's, you know, we're seeing a, a kind of an interesting time in the country with um, some large scale unionization efforts happening. I think it's just really important for all of us to talk to each other, to, to know who your neighbors are and just, and, and listen and um, listen to the workers of the city and uh, what kind of what their struggles are and um, you know, what their eight hour work day is. Big unions in a city like your own don't have a strike clause in their contract, which essentially means you guys aren't able to strike for better conditions. Um, what are other ways the union can negotiate a contract effectively without that? Luckily for me, I'm not involved in contract negotiation. So I, I'll start with that one because that is, it's, uh, it's very hard. But I think, you know, I would be critical of, of really, you know, again, our, our own membership, union members in general, and just really the general public that I think we've lost our way being involved in the political process overall. And a way for us to, to from the guy that works down the street or the girl that works on the street to our own membership is to be involved in the political, political process and to show up at town meetings and, um, and just be involved that way. Waltham has been renowned for being a worker city with a rich history in labor, um, which we should talk about another time. Um, do you have any insight into how or when Waltham lost that culture? Um, you know, it, it, that's, I think we still have it. And, you know, I've, I'm 38 going on 39 and, you know, growing up, it, it seemed like, you know, it was a good mix. There was always a good mix of white collar workers, blue collar workers, and just, you know, no contempt for one another. Um, growing up, there was two to three active farms in this operating within the city. Yeah, I think it's really important to embrace working people and whether you, you know, whether you bang nails like I do for a living or you sit in an office and type on a computer, I, um, we all, we all give a lot of our time and energy, um, to the working to, to work. So, um, it's important to remember current efforts, but it's also important to remember the workers struggle and, and lend an ear to, to, um, to what people go through each and every day. And I think, you know, the, I know the city is very focused on constituents and, and, uh, and that's, of course, important. But there's also a lot of other people that travel to the city each day. And it's important to, you know, I think we should represent those people as well. That, because people spend, they may not live here, but they spend a... a um, a good portion of their life here working within the city limits. The cost of living has been going up forever, uh, primarily in energy and rents. How can unions protect workers from this? So, I, I mean, just right off the bat from just our wages and benefits. Um, you know, we collectively, we're able to bargain together for the best possible wages and benefits. On the flip side of it, I know, actually, I think it's this evening in 
Boston, uh, my particular union, the carpenters are involved in a round table about rent stabilization with the mayor. The discussion between all of us, and, and this is more Boston centric, has been like, we build these high rise condo buildings and our members can't even afford to live within the city limits in, in, in any capacity. So, and, and that's coming from um, I, union members that make a decent wage. So we've, I think it's important for us once again to be involved in, in all the discussions um, at the city city level. And of course, you know, Boston has more resources, but it goes for the city of Waltham too, right? We've seen rent and, and you know, the median price for a home are just really insane to be, to be quite frank. And, uh, you know, I, I'm somebody that like, you know, missed, maybe missed the bubble by 10 or 15 years where I'm kind of out of that, that realm of, um, affordability. And, you know, some of that falls to me. Sure. I'll take that hit. But like, I know there's members coming up that are Waltham residents that are in the apprenticeship and, they, you know, they, they have dreams of owning a home like anybody or owning a condo or, and there, there's really not room for these people, unfortunately, in the city. So. Speaking of politics, do you have, are you going to run for city council this session? I have no plans to run for city council. Um, as far as I have just became president of my local. And so I'm just, trying to focus on that for the time being and, and making sure, um, you know, I'm a good steward to my local and, and uh, look out for my 1500 members, but you would not be the first person um, or maybe even the first person in this zoom meeting to bring that up recently, <laughs> but um, you never know. So. Uh, I was afraid you were going to run in ward five when I decided to run in ward five, uh, but you just got redistricted to ward six too. Did you, did you get your letter in the mail? I believe I'm actually in Ward One. Oh wait, really? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, you should definitely run. <laughs> that would be awesome, James. I had a quick thing. It was funny that you mentioned the Cooper Street thing with Callahan because I live right near there, and that was a very memorable fire. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's, I, you know, it's it's funny because we can bicker about a lot of um, little things that happen within the city. But that fire has not still is still unresolved as to who who and how that fire happened. So it, it's it just um, you know recently popped up in my memories as so whenever it was four or five years ago. So um, yeah, it, it, I'll I'll leave that one at that too as well. Did you know I learned last year that there's quite a few people in the city that think I burned down that complex, which is, I think, hilarious. There's quite yeah, a few new people in the city that think I caused the largest fire in Waltham's history, which is... Yeah, well, uh, that just goes to show uh, people, I think, have a little too much time on their hands. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, obviously, I would imagine that's an ongoing investigation, and I have, you know, as well as you know, we had, we have written affidavits, which I had just recently seen from one, one of our organizers regarding workers on that project being exploited. Hmm. So there's, there's thoughts within our union, because obviously at the time we were investigating, you know, worker exploitation on that project as to, you know, who, possibly you know and it, it's all speculation at this point but clearly that's uh that's an ongoing investigation i don't think any anybody that lives in the city was involved in that in any way so that, and that's i i would clear you your name to, to put it out there i'm no investigator but i do not think chris gamble lit that on fire perfect my name is cleared. Um, okay, well, thank you very much, Tom, for coming on. I hope to bring you on more. Uh, talk about labor when uh, when the opportunity arises. I appreciate it. And I'd, I'd be remiss not to uh, throw a plug out Please. for anybody that's really looking for a career in the building trades, because 
I'm a first generation carpenter. I knew absolutely nothing about carpentry, commercial carpentry. And I just went to my union hall and applied. Um, and the good thing about us is we pay you to learn. You are paid on the job to learn the trade as well as depending on the trade, like for example, the carpenters, we have a week of school every three months while you learn on the job. So, and we're equal pay, whether you're male, female, transgender, black, white, Hispanic, it's all equal pay. And, um, you know, I was, I, I had to have a giggle to myself when I heard WBZ, you know, a month or two ago, talking about a big tech company and how, wow, they're working so hard on, you know, equal pay for men and women. And I was like, we've been doing that for over 140 years. You know, that's, that's what we're all about. So um, we do have an apprenticeship program, like I mentioned, and uh, also the spots for journey, journey level carpenters as well. And it, it never hurts. You don't, you don't need to be a fourth generation union member. You don't need to know somebody to get in. You don't need to know, every, you know, a thing about it. It's a good, it's a good career path for people that, you know, whether you went to college, you don't think you could go to college. Um, it's open for anybody. 18, 20, 30, 40, 50, uh, uh, the door is always open. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, thank you, Tom. So um, that's great. So our other uh, top story that I mentioned at the beginning, um, we mentioned last week, we updated you on the effort to gather signatures at Marsket Basket and Hannaford for a ballot initiative that would overturn the recent decision by the legislature to allow undocumented immigrants to apply for driver's licenses. And um, we mentioned that there had been some protests and there's a group called Fair and Secure that appeared to be organizing this and they kept posting pictures that they said were showing that people were, in, were harassing or intimidating or blocking. My interpretation was the pictures didn't really show that at all. You can go on their site and see for yourself. I also mentioned that the Massachusetts Republican party appeared to be behind that effort, and they are, uh, because Jim Lyons, the head of the party, just filed suit against Maura Healy, the attorney general, who is also running for governor, um, accusing her of failing to protect the signature gatherers from harassment. So it seems like maybe this is something they've been planning as a way to hurt her in the governor race. Um, last week, James had made a comment that they, they were kind of telling on themselves when they talked about the harassment by saying what they expected to happen or what they wanted to happen. Well, maybe they were actually planning on suing Maura Healy all along. But also named in the lawsuit were three other people. One of them was a, is a state senator, Jamie Eldridge. Um, one of them is a community organizer from Somerville, and one of them is our own Jonathan Paz of Waltham. He's not named as a counselor, he's named as, a, as an individual. Um, and the lawsuit claims that these three people were part of an effort to organize people to block, physically block access um, to the signing. Um, and it also alleges that protesters, and it doesn't really say how the the, the defendants were involved in this, but it also alleges that protesters took pictures of people who were collecting signatures and then put their uh, images online to invite people to ID them so that they could be harassed. Um, I don't know if that's true. I don't think that's true. It caught my attention because I took pictures and I showed you my pictures last week of four people who are public figures in Waltham. So I thought it was fair game to uh, show you pictures of them participating in a public process. And also one person who isn't a public figure, but she was wearing a shirt for a far right group while she was participating in this public process. So I thought that was newsworthy to show you a picture of her. So if someone did in fact um, threaten these people online, I don't condone that, but I haven't seen that happening. I'm not, not sure what they're referring to. Um, but this is very interesting. 
um, because I mean, it's not, uh, it's usually bad news to get sued, but what the suit also says is that they were very effective. It actually says in the suit that PaaS succeeded in shutting down signature collecting. So the other side of it is it means that PaaS is a pretty good community organizer. So actually with that, uh, Chris or, or James, did you have any comment on this? Um, yeah, I mean, we we're just talking about people running for city council. It's about, it's about that time to start talking about that. And some people are talking about who's going to run for mayor. And some people are throwing out the, the name Paz. And I've been saying, like, you know, I don't think he would win. But now that this lawsuit is here, he might as well run. He's, he would win so quickly. He's got all the momentum now in the world. He can do anything he wants because this lawsuit can be turned around uh, to make him look very good because I think it's a silly lawsuit and it will really only shine a spotlight on the good work he's doing. And uh, so you can you run for mayor. Why not? Go in. I'm inclined to agree that it is a silly lawsuit. Um, it definitely it just sounds like it's them trying to make themselves out to be the victim. And it kind of plays, it, you, can, you can see it in the just the premise that it's like oh they were blocking access to this and they don't have any real evidence of it other than the assertions of the people that were there which again it sounded like they were sort of expecting this to happen thus they kind of were trying to hoping it would happen so they could then pursue action against the political figures involved yeah it, it, i have to imagine it's just to have a chilling effect to prevent more of this in the future more than anything else and i think that's why it's good that they're hopefully hopefully they'll be pushing back on this yeah, I mean, earlier, but I read a little bit of the text of the lawsuit, and it really seemed to look like it was written more than it's a lawsuit. It would said things like, you know, uh, you know, Paz and Eldridge were desperate to shut down this effort because they knew that if the ballot, you know, if the initiative got on the ballot, it would succeed. And it's like, well, that's probably not true. And it's not really a legal argument. It's something they're saying for when Republican voters read this, I think, um, because they're hoping that this is going to uh, get Republican voters out to vote, that this ballot initiative or the controversy over it, that they're, they're worried Republic, maybe worried Republican voters are going to stay home in November, and this is going to get them out to vote. I also wanted to mention that we've talked on this show before about sometimes people who are sort of like libertarians uh, when it comes to national politics are very happy to tell their neighbors what they can and can't do on their own property. And Jim Lyons, the head of the Republican Party, was actually involved in a very extreme example of this. He lives in either Andover or North Andover, I forget which, and North Andover. Yeah, and um, he got into his neighbors moved in and were doing an addition on their house that his family didn't like. They got into an epic feud for years and years and a court battle that ended with his neighbors going to prison for, for, for harassing him in response to them. I won't say harassing because the court didn't find that, but of course, if you, to, uh, in response to the Lions doing whatever it was they did to try to get their neighbors to stop building their addition, their neighbors, whatever they did back, landed them in prison. So uh, this idea of the constant, you know, the 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 uh, sort of gray area definition of what constitutes harassment seems to be a theme of Jim Lyons' career, and so I uh, expect he's not going to be very successful with this lawsuit. And I hope that that Chris is right that succeeds in just getting political points for pass. Uh, unrelated to you mentioning the the bad libertarian neighbor just reminded me of Rand Paul getting tackled on his lawnmower by his neighbor or something some other thing like that <laughs> yeah if you look up the 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 stories about um this this feud the lions has had with their neighbor there's almost more stories about that than there are about the time lions was in the legislature it, it was like a big deal for many years so uh it's an interesting story um, so one other story we have for you, we just want to update you on a few things we talked last week about um, what's going on with pot shops. Um, I had mentioned that there was a new state law that um, allowed the state to get involved in the town's process. And that's not correct. That's a law that is being discussed. It has not been passed yet. So we don't know the details of it yet, but the intent is that when one of the reasons we legalize pot is to try to mitigate the effects of the war on drugs. And when it was first legalized, there was a lot of talk about social equity applicants, meaning that people from certain ethnic backgrounds would have an advantage. And that hasn't happened at all. Only about 5% of the licenses given out in Massachusetts are to so-called social equity applicants. And as far as we 
we can tell in Waltham's process, there is no uh, there is no social equity. That's not part of the process, as far as we know. So that may not be what's putting pressure on the council to meet over the summer and get this taken care of. There may be something else putting on them on a pressure on them, like maybe they're sued or getting sued or worried about getting sued by one of the applicants. We still don't know that for sure. But another update has to do with a letter that Councillor Cates sent. Can you tell us about that, James? Oh yeah, so this is read in the last meeting, and I think I unfairly characterized it as being uh, both NIMBY and also bringing up like potential crime that would get caused, and it was strictly mentioning the traffic uh, upon a second reading, and we'll link it in this, but one of the things that did jump out at me was that he both was asserting, or rather both was mentioning that it was um, going to make traffic worse, but that it was also on the rail trail and that it wasn't near any residential areas or uh, recreational areas. So it's kind of like a, when you, as you hear that, it's like, what else could you be complaining about? But at the same time, there aren't any other, and that's something that's gonna be done in the future, it doesn't exist currently. And there aren't many parks there. There isn't much transit there. I think that I would characterize this letter as a little bit too, uh, perhaps a little too blunt about his opinion on this, but I think, Chris, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, this was uh, an email that Paul sent out, and then it was read in committee, and then um, I reached out to the city clerk's office to see if I could get a copy of it, and we'll include it, um, but it's the only real communication from any counselor showing any opinion about these pot shops. And I think Paul, um, while we appreciate the transparency, he is, he's fallen for the classic conundrum of letting his opinion be known in the council when there, I'm sure there's other counselors here that share this opinion and have worse opinions, but they know to keep it to themselves. So we don't talk about it, but Paul fell for that trap. So now we're gonna talk about it. And there's a lot of weird things in this letter um like yeah him talking about that it's right next that is right next to the rail trail but there's no recreational spaces in nearby and the fact that he's saying that traffic will increase in this one particular site which is the 1256 main street but that the other four sites don't share that sensitivity when the traffic commission themselves said that traffic would get obliterated by these new developments um it's just all over the place and it's clearly a mix between constituent feedback and his own opinions. Um, and I think it's all over the place and I'm glad that we acquired it. We will post that on the, the our Medium um, uh, channel for people who wanna read that. Um, and I live very close to the, where the shop would go and, and Councillor Cates is now my counselor with the redistricting. Um, and I disagree on them. I think it would be a good spot because of the ones that are proposed, it's the only one that's on a bus line. You could get there on the 70 and there are people who use pot for medicine and a lot of them don't drive. So that makes a big difference. The other part of it is I think the long-term economic viability of it, if there were four on Bear Hill, um, none of them are accessible by a public transportation, it's they're gonna make there's no way for them to differentiate themselves from each other because the prices don't vary very much between shops. It's mostly location and service that makes people decide to go to a certain place. Um, so they're gonna make money anyways in the short term because it's a booming business, but inevitably the economics of that are gonna change at some point. And we could end up with three boarded up pot shops in Bear Hill, which would definitely make it look like a bad neighborhood. And um, they're not going to be able to compete with the shops in neighboring towns, which are either on a bus line or visible from the highway or both in some cases. They're going to have a hard time competing when there are four shops on Bear Hill. And that might still be a problem if there are three on Bear Hill and one on Main Street, but at least there's some differentiation between um, the two places. But I also wonder if they turn down one of the Bear Hill applicants and do accept the Main Street um, applicant, does that mean they're going to get sued by whoever they turn down on Bear Hill? Because there's not enough difference between those four businesses to explain why they would turn down one and not the others. So I wonder if, um, you know, this letter could sort of 
say, pave the way to set them up to turn down the Main Street one, and then they're not likely to get sued by any of the Bear Hill ones, but we may have, uh, they may not be very, very sustainable businesses there. So we'll see. Anything else on that? Um, James, do you think they're going to be talking about pot shops at this meeting on Monday? August 1st, yes. Uh, they, they, they said that in the last rules and ordinances, there's a special rules and ordinances for this coming Monday where they... they I, I, I don't think they, they said that they were going to make any decision, but it sounded like they were planning... They were going to have more counselors there than just the off-committee members that had been showing up to the previous meetings. Because they, they, that was like one of the things that I think putting on the spot, but I think it was Darcy who had said that uh, they wanted to make, make send out an email internally to make sure that counselors were aware that this meeting would be happening in that session. So. Great. So so we're going to be back next Tuesday and we'll cover that meeting, but I also encourage people to watch it because it could be a really interesting one because Pod Shops is on the agenda, but also the Fernal, the mayor, it looks like the mayor is going to ask the Historical Commission and the council for permission to do something at the Fornal site that affects something historical. And what I think may happen is she's going to ask for permission to do something very specific without giving the whole plan of what she wants to do with the firm. And what I'm hoping will happen was that she'll have to have more of a discussion about what's in general what's happening with the fernal. But we'll see. It should be interesting. So thank you, Chris and James. Thank you, Heather May and Tom Geary. Thank you very much for being here. And we'll see you next week. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone.